Hey guys, welcome back to the Elevate HD podcast. This is episode 12 and today I am joined by Dean and Lizzie McKillop of Flex Success. So welcome to the podcast guys. You want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Uh, I didn't take Dean's last name. I was going to say when we got married. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not Lizzie McKillop. <laughs> hey, what was that? What is your last name? Oh, Rorda. Oh, I don't love the last it's not name. on your Instagram name. I just didn't really think. <laughs> no, no, it's totally fine. It's totally fine. I'm just thinking, like, who is Lizzie McKillop? That is yeah, a exactly. stranger to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you for having us on. It's an honor. Uh, Dean and I. I guess we'll start with an introduction, who we are, what Flex Success is. Yeah. You want to take it? Well, I suppose we're a collection of coaches mm-hmm. founded in Circa eight years ago. I know you normally say Circa and then the year, but I couldn't do the math quick enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're excused. Circa 2014. Um, and yeah, we, we started working in the online space, coaching a combination of general population clients looking just to have general fitness goals or weight loss or muscle gain goals. And then also some uh, body specific or physique specific Um, bodybuilding clients as well Mm -hmm. Um, what else are we well uh, flex success the name actually came from the term flexible dieting because at the time we were staunch flexible dieters and we figured this is the future this is the way forward we since are less staunch uh, (laughs) that Mm. flexible dieting is the way forward for everyone I think it's really helpful for a lot of people uh, at least for points in time but we know that there are other ways. So we, mm. you know, we, we still like flexible dieting, but we know there's other ways. Um, we, as well as coaching, have some mini courses. We have a program called the Better Bodies Program, uh, which is aimed at creating sustainable transformations for people who are sick of starting and failing and starting again and then failing and then starting again. You know, you know the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we have our own podcast. So, yeah, that's us. Yeah, you've a lot going on because that's what kind of stood out to me when I looked at the Flex Success brand is not only the coaching, but that like the education side of things is really interesting that you've incorporated those two. Yeah, one of our biggest things we've always said, um, I actually have heard another company mention this as well. It may actually be Luke Miller. He's used this terminology too. Uh, and that is that we've always been trying to leave the industry in a better place by increasing the standard of expectation around both the coach like as in what they should expect of themselves from a knowledge perspective perspective, and also what the client should expect from coaches. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, eight years ago, there was a lot of people that were very, very disappointed and left in the lurch from coaches. So um, we've always been here to try and raise the industry standard. That's one of our things. Mm. It's true. Mm. Yeah, because it can be hard at times because it's not highly regulated. So no one really has any standards to like adhere to. You kind of have to make your own. Yeah. Mm. It's a shame. I, I'm not sure if COVID has anything to do with it, but I'm seeing a lot of people move online. Mm. And with a saturation of coaches, there seems to be just like a lot of really poor coaching practices yeah. um, that end up harming clients more than helping them. And we just, man, we, we really care about our clients. We have a, a client-centric approach here at Flex Success, which means if it's harder for the coach, but it's better for the client, then that's what we're going to do. Um, so, yeah, it's really upsetting to see so many people flood into the industry with really no qualifications, no experience, very little knowledge, and they're just cookie-cutter dieting all of their clients. And, yeah, we... We definitely want to lift the industry standard to so that everyone understands coaches and clients alike that that's not okay. Mm. Another thing that I've seen, I think, with the on um, like the birth of like the business mentorships for coaches is a lot of them kind of talk down personal training as a profession. So a lot of personal trainers jump the gun and go on like maybe too soon before they're ready because these mm. mentors are telling them, do you just want to be counting reps on the gym floor, like talking down the profession when really if you're a good personal trainer, that is the last thing you're going to be doing when you're looking at a client and yeah. them as they train. Um, so that kind of narrative, I think, is not a, not a positive one for because personal training can like if you're a good personal trainer like that is a really good career and, it, and it's difficult it's, it's challenging and requires a lot of skill so you should absolutely say, okay I've you know I'm bored of personal training I'm going to go online because number one they're two different things and number two personal training in itself is a, a skill that takes time to develop mm. yeah they're, but they're both separate in that your ability to communicate the message online is different to in person mm-hmm. but I think this also comes out of the fact that there's 
uh, let's let's rabbit ears them. Business coaches that are trying to tell people that they're they're, they're limited by time as a personal trainer, whereas the scalability of online is huge. Mm -hmm. The issue is is that you have to negate you have to you have to forget about your your ethics around quality over quantity in either scenario if you want to play the numbers game. So like even us at Fletch, we've always really uh, been quite tightly controlled on how how many clients we'll, we'll cap ourselves at per week so that there is a quality client-centric approach over a quantity. Like you can always do more clients, but the more you do, the poorer you do it typically. Oh, don't yeah. we see coaches boast about how yeah. many, like I do 200 clients in a week. Like, bro, do the math on that. Like that's hey, five minutes a client. That's crazy. What the hell? Yeah. Yeah, I... Um, I, I was a PT for nearly 10 years before moving online. And because I have a lot of experience in both being an online nutrition coach and a PT, I understand that they are so different. But I wonder if, because I did feel the pressure to dabble in nutrition as a PT. I never did, but I felt the pressure because clients are like, Lizzie, give me a meal plan. Lizzie, what should I eat? Blah, blah, blah. And yeah, that sometimes they can just be confused roles. And so there's PTs out there dabbling in nutrition coaching when it's not in their scope of practice. It's not their jam. It's not what they do well. And it kind of waters down both services. Yeah. I think it's best like, I mean, I'm not saying nutrition coaches can't also be PTs, but understand the distinctions. Mm. They're different. So, so very different. And that's the problem with being an online coach is that you're kind of expected to be a jack of all trades in a way because you end up being, you know, a counselor and a therapist and like trying to manage injuries and like all this stuff that probably a lot of online coaches aren't, it isn't within their scope, but they're expected to do yeah. that. So that can be difficult as well. Instead of like feeling okay to like outsource if you need to and refer if you think it's not within your abilities. Mm. Yeah, that's one of the greatest things I see in people, their ability or their, their willingness to outsource tells me that they're confident in their ability of their primary skill set. Mm. You know, like it, if I was worried about my primary skill set as a bodybuilding specific contest preparation coach, like getting people as humanly lean as possible, then I probably wouldn't also refer out for other things because I'd fear someone may take my client. But the reality is, is I'm very confident in my ability to get them to stage. So then because of that, I can then refer out. And that just comes again from knowing my place spending enough time in the education space knowing what's best for the client spending enough time in the application mm. space and trying to like make this like a proper coaching role mm. Mm. Yeah. and that's what that's what I wanted to achieve we were kind of talking about why I started the podcast before we started recording but um I just want to put education at the forefront of coaches and personal trainers kind of minds because I think it is easy as we said if you get really busy you get loads of clients and you're doing check-ins and programs all day long that education kind of falls to the side because there's not much time for it but I really think there should be a priority there to maintain it to a certain extent you don't have to study hours on end every single day but definitely should be something you should take over and always be developing and either you know doing courses or reading studies or even going to in-person seminars which I find really really useful um just always to progress that knowledge because you want to be developing yourself as well yeah, for sure. I mean, in the personal training space, at least in Australia, where I was a PT, uh, you need to get a particular amount of CECs, which stands for continuing educational credits to maintain your membership um, as a personal trainer to stay registered. Mm -hmm. But we know that personal training is, you know, a little more regulated mm -hmm. than, than online coaching, which really isn't regulated at all. So I'm not saying that we should definitely have CECs, but yeah, I'd like to see some sort of formal commitment um, to education uh, because I think the really good coaches stay committed to education because they care about what they do yeah but I think there needs to be more incentives for for everyone else that's a little bit less motivated by that yeah. Yeah, I think it depends. Like for me, I didn't start coaching until I was like probably overqualified. I just did all the courses. I was like, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. And then eventually I just went for it. Uh, but I'd like done my nutrition course. I was doing RTS. I was like, I'd done all these like courses because I just wanted to make sure I was fully equipped. But I could have literally just said online, I'm now taking on clients having had nothing done. And it would have been, no one would have known the difference. So it is, there definitely should be, I, I know it's hard to regulate an industry like that, but obviously there has to be, there really should be something because there, as we've seen a lot of malpractice in the industry, dangerous protocols, um, and it can be quite scary. So you need to, yeah, something needs to be done. I don't know what, but <laughs> some way to improve. Yeah, the, the governing body to come over that would, would be huge. But I mean, you know, the ISSN have it, 
there's plenty of like places that have it so well I mean I wouldn't go to a day surgery and just like let anyone inject something into yeah. them. like I would want them to be qualified but it seems like the consumers of nutrition coaching don't demand that level of I don't know like qualifications they're just happy to kind of go with anyone that has a good body and thinking yeah. that like well, if they look good, therefore, like that's the qualification mm. where we know, like maybe people just have really good genetics. Maybe they actually go about like really shitty nutrition and exercise practices and they're going to crash and burn in the next couple of years. Mm. Maybe they take a lot of drugs, maybe like a, a little bit of all three. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it has to come from both ends. I think like some regulation coaches need to improve their expectations of themselves but also I think like from a consumer perspective there needs to be a higher standard of demand yeah yeah people need to realize that just because they eat every day doesn't mean that it's a simple thing I think that's the problem <laughs> just because you eat you're not gonna you know most people are like oh yeah food's just normal like it's not that big of a deal you know yeah. we all eat mm -hmm. um, whereas we don't all just casually do day surgery on herself so like there's yeah. this expectation that that person has to have learned more mm. um, but yeah I, I agree yeah so that's good but today anyway <laughs> going way off topic I wanted to get you guys on to talk about your informed eating concept because when I first heard about it I thought it was really really interesting because obviously we often hear about like intuitive eating or mindful eating but I thought informed eating was a really like nicely coined term uh so do you want to explain what it is where it came from Okay, before we do, I'd actually be interested to hear what you think informed eating is. Oh, okay. So I was actually speaking to this uh, with my mum last night because I was telling her that I was getting you guys on. And I was saying that, like, we like to think that intuitive eating is kind of this, I don't know, heaven where you can just subconsciously be able to eat the exact amount of food you want to eat without any sort of awareness or knowledge behind it. You kind of just listen to your body, quote unquote. Um, but I suppose the problem with intuitive eating is there are a lot of people who eat intuitively that are overweight or unhealthy um, because they're telling they're eating the way that their body is telling them to or their mind is telling them to. So I suppose informed eating to me would be um, education first and developing that knowledge and awareness and, and skills and tools you need to equip you to then make those decisions in a more like informed or educated manner. Okay, end of podcast, you pretty much. <laughs> the great thing about the term informed eating is it's almost impossible not to say to make an informed choice around yeah. based on the knowledge. Yeah. That's what's yeah. sort of, that's what. Yeah, no, you, you nailed it. So basically there's three pillars to informed eating. The first one being an understanding of nutrition. So just basic macros and calories, you know, we can consider micros in there as well. What's nutrient dense, what's not so nutrient dense. Then we've got an understanding of your individual needs. So Dean might eat, I don't know, 6,000 cows a day. I'll eat two. Uh, and then there's also an understanding of your personal preferences. So there's no point in telling someone, hey, this is what your nutritional needs are, like your calories and macros and micros, for example. These are the foods to fit them. If they hate that food, they're not going to do it. So we also need to consider our preferences. So we start from a place of filling the knowledge gaps. You know, that might be going through a process of tracking macros to figure out what's in food, or it might be um, learning more than just macros, how like we don't want to just be filling our macros with protein shakes and pop tarts. Like there needs to be <laughs> some education around what's nutritious as well. And I, I don't think that too many people need to spend too long in that because we know that an apple is probably a bit more nutritious than a donut. Like that, that bit is kind of that's pretty intuitive. Um, and after some time figuring out, you know, what's in food, what our needs are, eventually we don't need to weigh everything on the scale. We, we have a book called um, Life After Dieting. Life After Dieting. How can I forget the book's name? A Guide to Informed Eating. And we initially wrote it for people that were macro tracking and felt stuck macro tracking forever and had this fear that if I don't weigh every ingredient on my plate and I don't track everything in my fitness pal, I'm going to blow up and become obese. Well, probably not because now you know a lot about food from macro tracking. You understand what your individual needs are because you've been filling those needs. Now we can just make informed choices about our food and keep similar habits and behaviors. You're just not tracking it anymore, you know? 
maybe if you eat a little more chocolate, you know, the next day, maybe we'll just skip dessert that day, or maybe we'll choose something less energy dense for dessert the following day, something like that. So making informed choices, going a little over on holidays and maybe a little under the week that you get back, something like that. Or on a meal by meal basis or whatever it may be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, essentially. And so even though we wrote the book for macro trackers that had this fear of letting go of macro tracking, and taking them through the process of letting go, which we do in the book. Um, I do think that it can also apply for people who aren't necessarily afraid of letting go of macro tracking, but just want to spend less time being anal about their food. Yeah, and it can be helpful for, because I know your audience are mainly bodybuilders, it can be helpful for the off season when people need like a mental break uh, but they don't want to take 10 steps backwards. Yeah, like even from, from an implementation perspective. So uh, I actually put a, a quick story post up yesterday about... Story or post? Well, I said story. I posted on you my said story. story post. Yeah, story <laughs> post. <laughs> Which it was one? a story post. You put, okay, post I posted it on, on my story a snippet of something that I'd written to a client of mine about the difference between the intention and mindset around a cheat meal versus a free meal, you know? Mm. And although the language of that may seem similar in that you have the freedom to eat whatever you want on a free meal approach versus a cheat meal is you're cheating on your diet, is that it allows using a free meal approach, which to me is uh, making informed choices around the foods that you want to eat based on like a social preference, personal preference, a pleasure preference, but still aligning them within your goals to a certain degree Mm. versus a cheat meal is just, completely you know deep fried mars bar because you can't eat it any yeah, other time. or just completely eradicating the the the, the acknowledgement that your goals still exist mm. and trying to fit as much food in as possible right is that using an informed approach eg having people understand what's in their food their personal goals and all the rest of it is when they get to a free meal they can now start to make far more educated far more mature decisions around their food so that they can have social freedom in an off season they can have even some pleasure freedom to a certain extent in regards to the foods that they consume, some macronutrient freedom, but they're not setting themselves up for then three days of trying to fix an overabundance of calories that they've typically gone for in a cheat meal to use the air quotes again. So, mm. you know, having that informed approach through an off season is still very possible to then make better choices for an off season bodybuilder or performance athlete too. Yeah. It's probably worth also mentioning that there are elements of intuitive eating in informed eating. Yeah. Um, an example would be we still encourage mindful eating. So, so in, um, intuitive eating for anyone, any listeners here that are totally unfamiliar with it, it's not a weight management system. It's um, uh, what do they call it? They call weight it neutral. a, it's a weight neutral approach, yeah. but there's uh, like 10 elements as a self-care framework, sorry, is what they call it is the word I was looking for. Um, and part of that is, you know, listening to your hunger signals, um, giving yourself unconditional permission to eat, things like that. So within uh, informed eating, we like to encourage the hunger scale, which is pulled from intuitive eating. And the hunger scale is one to 10. It's not one, not hungry at all, 10, really hungry. It's more like this. Five is neutral and neither hungry nor full. And we want to listen to our own hunger signals and start eating when we're, you know, a little bit hungry. We don't want to wait until we're absolutely starving because then what happens is portion uh, portion control becomes really difficult. We're probably going to eat really fast. We're not going to practice mindful eating and we might make poor choices in what we eat. So we encourage the hunger scale. People start eating when they're like a, maybe like a three hungry, one being absolutely starving, five being neutral. And we eat to like a six or a seven, you know, we're satisfied a little full. We're not a 10. We're not like, I need to unbutton my jeans. I'm so uncomfortable. I need a nap. We're not at a cheat meal. Yeah. We're not like cheat meal level. So there are elements from intuitive eating that we can use within informed eating. And I think uh, even though somebody might be using informed eating to manage their body weight, even if that management is maintenance, um, we, we can pull elements from a weight neutral approach. And by weight neutral, I mean people who do informed eating typically don't have a focus on weight. It's more about self-care. It's like, if my weight goes up, it goes up. If it goes down, like... Yeah, they're neither trying, trying to gain nor lose, nor do anything. They're just trying to essentially, I suppose, like find a better relationship with food and mm. their ability to manage all of these things that Liz has just mentioned around like hunger and appetite and self-care and whatnot. So, yeah, because there's definitely a big misappropriation uh, with that concept 
of intuitive eating, mm. you know? If we were to eat intuitively 150 years ago when there were no highly palatable foods available to us. And we had to walk everywhere. We had to and... walk everywhere and all that. It, mm. it becomes a lot more difficult to, to gain weight excessively to the point in which we are in developed countries now in 2022. Which is why it's called an obesogenic environment. Yeah. Mm. So, like, we live in that. Um, so, but the, there's certainly elements to the intuitive e eating uh, framework that are extremely important, especially for macro trackers who have been doing it for years, hence the Life After Dieting book, to start to learn about because there's a lot of individuals that have just spent the last two, three, four, five, or even 10 years eating to numbers mm. and having no mindfulness, having no recognition of what hungry is, having no recognition of what, you know, satisfaction is and all the rest of it. They just eat because my fitness pal says you've still got macros left. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great learning tool for them. They stop eating when their macros are filled. They start eating when it's meal time. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I find is like when you're a child, you have this inherent awareness of when you're full and you don't finish the food on your plate if you don't want to. But then you, you beat that out of yourself when you start living to numbers and having to finish all the food on your plate because that's what you've weighed out and that's what's on your plan. So then you just unlearn this inherent ability to know what you need to eat so then when you come away from tracking or you, you stop competing or you decide you want to go into this kind of more intuitive area you have to relearn that skill and redevelop it because you kind of just yeah. unlearned and unraveled it all this all these years even things like parents not letting you leave the table until you've finished everything on your plate like, like there are cultural elements to it it's worth mentioning though that there are some limitations to informed eating and that would be somebody really close to a competition where it doesn't really matter if you're hungry like fucking, you can have a cup of concrete if you're hungry like, drink <laughs> that <laughs> so for most of the time and for off seasons it's fine um but there are times that people who inherently just have a low appetite and they find it really hard to maintain a weight they want to maintain maybe they have to eat more often than what their hunger signals suggest yeah. or the other way around you know or, or maybe we need to understand what hunger really is like just because I'm triggered to eat I might say to myself oh I should eat because I'm hungry but then I think okay let me reference the hunger scale out of a you know five being neutral from one to ten how hungry am I you know what I just walked past a bakery and that smelt really good but I'm a five mm. like maybe I won't eat mm. yeah like one of, one of the greatest things about learning how to track one of the greatest things it does is it does give you the opportunity to understand what is in food from a mathematical energy perspective. Mm. Fantastic, because now we can make some informed choices around managing calorie balance. What's worth it? Yeah. One of the worst things about it is it completely or well, can completely remove your introspection, your ability to look at internal cues like Liz has just mentioned to determine whether or not you're truly hungry or do you just have a craving? Like, do you even understand the difference between that sort of homeostatic hunger versus hedonic? homeostatic being more physical, empty stomach, driven by physiology, hedonic being more like pleasure seeking flavor, you have a particular craving. Uh, people don't know how to, to, to distinguish between the two of these if they are just solely macro tracking sometimes. Mm. Um, so there's this is the cool thing about the informed eating concept is that we've sort of tried to marry some of these together so that we give people the opportunity to make informed choices. Yeah. Yeah, because I was finding as well, um, after years and years of tracking, I kind of gave myself this false idea that I had to finish all the food on my plate. That's just the way I was. And I always had to finish my plate and I could never leave it behind. But then I read um, The Joy of Half a Cookie. I don't know if you've read that. Um, I haven't. But it's a brilliant book about teaching you, like relearning hunger, relearning how to be satisfied, relearning how to kind of save your food and enjoy it and not just eat for the sake of it. Um, and it introduces like the hunger scale and the fullness scale and all this kind of stuff. And I realized that I was just literally telling myself that as an excuse, being like, I have to finish the food on my plate because I didn't address the problem, which was me like kind of forgetting how to pay attention to my internal cues and signals. The joy of half the cookie. That's awesome. really, I actually, I, I always talk about it. I recommend it to all my clients. It's such a good book. If you want to read it, it's very, very helpful for you and for yeah. your clients, kind of having that awareness. That sounds interesting. It's really cool. Like even, um, I'll say there's another caveat to the informed approach that Liz has talked about. So like I'm currently using an informed approach post-comp right now. Like I'm nearly six weeks post-comp and I've, I've not weighed nor tracked. Oh, that's not, not fully true. I've weighed a couple of things like if I wanted to add peanut butter to a cream of rice recipe that needs a certain amount, I'll weigh that because I'm, I'm anal about getting good quality cream of rice. Right? 
um, or highly palatable things like that that aren't serving size controlled. Like a, a teaspoon out of the jar can be 10 grams or 20 grams, right? Um, is the more you know, the more you can also fear over consuming. So there's a, there's a learning tool to also not under eating as an individual coming out of a highly stringent tracking session or, or, or phase into this phase that I'm currently in because, because you know so much, you can just, in, you know, by default, always opt for the lower option mm -hmm. in fear of eating too much. And then vice versa, you can eat too much when you don't know enough because you're just eating to, to palate. Yeah, you like almonds of protein, right? Okay, I'll yeah. eat a whole fistful of almonds. It's a great so, protein source. <laughs> yeah, but what you've said is exactly right. You know, like with my clients, I'm like, hey, like maybe we might make this last meal of the day an informed sort of meal. Um, but it's actually okay if you're full and you don't want to, you don't want to eat. Like, that's cool. Like, just go to bed. You, you, yeah, I've got a 3,000 calorie target there. But if you've eaten 2,500 and you're full, this is a great learning opportunity. That you don't have to eat the other half of the cookie, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's why I love that name because it just sparked that thought. It is cool. Mm. It is cool. Uh, At Flex Success, um, we also have something we teach our clients called the foundation diet, which eventually leads into informed eating. So it's basically helping people set up the foundations of their diet. You know, it could be for some people three square meals a day, using plate planning as a guide for what that square meal might look like. Half the plate might be fruits and vegetables. A quarter would be carbs and the other quarter would be protein and there might be like you know a thumb full of fat there and we could use the precision nutrition hand guide as well to figure out what a portion size of protein might look like you know like the thickness and size of your palm and a scooped hand would be the carbs for example so when people have this foundation one day they might choose rice another day it might be potatoes and then couscous or whatever and maybe they're swapping chicken breast for prawns or octopus Octopus is so gross. Can I just put that out there? Yeah. I love octopus. It um, it. Do you? It Ooh. looks it, but it's delicious. It's an it's an if aliens exist and they're <laughs> actually yeah. <laughs> just saying. Well, that's a quick note. You should watch that. What's the my teacher? My on, teacher, the octopus. Yeah, something. my teacher, my octopus teacher on Netflix is actually really good. And it is definitely aliens. But yeah. Anyways, getting sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> so when people have this foundation, it's hard to be too far off what you know your, your daily calories are because yes rice has a little more uh, total calories than potato if we go gram for gram but not that much mm. you know so when people have this foundation it doesn't matter if they're on holidays if it's the weekend if it's monday or friday so long as you know maybe there's an extra dessert when they're on holidays or like a, a cocktail by the pool or something like that but it's only going to be a few more like a couple of hundred calories a day and then when they get back to normal life those calories come out again and weight's gonna you know if weight had shifted at all because you walk more on holidays usually weight will come back down so even if somebody isn't quite yet at the stage of informed eating which i do think is the end goal for most people they want to get to a place where they're enjoying their food they're making informed choices they're managing their weight without being too anal the foundation diet can be a great stepping stone for someone. Um, and my foundation looks a little different to Dean's foundation, you know, like half his plate might be protein because he's got way higher protein needs than me. But the point is, yeah. <laughs> those yeah, are so some big yeah, hands. Right? <laughs> um, but the point is like the foundation is still set yeah. and there are habits that people can maintain ongoing. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of people like obviously with the caveat that like with it, an extreme physique goal you need to be highly specific like if you're getting on stage and you, you can't have this kind of estimation protocol but Sorry. when you're looking at even day to day the margin of error in every food you eat anyway is like according to the law in the UK I don't know about the um in Australia but it's 20 percent plus or minus you it's have the same. Anyway. so like the amount of error you could have in a day without even realizing thinking everything is exactly on point could literally be 20 40 percent in total outside of what you think it's going to be which is crazy so life is inherently inaccurate anyway yeah so when you're you're changing your um i'm going to use beetroot as an option because my client actually had this in his mfb diet the other 67 and a half grams of beetroot oh my god <laughs> if, uh, so specific he actually wasn't he just it, it was a can of whatever that works out to be times by four and he just split into four meals yeah so he wasn't yeah. being that bad, but there okay. was a period where at one stage he was like that. He was dialing up like way to like 32 grams, you know, 33 grams, 34 grams. And I'm like, yeah, dude, you've got more margin for error in all of your food than you're even controlling for. So yeah. don't worry about it. You know? 
I know it's all these and this is like something I actually worked on with Luke Hoffman when I was with him is like if you do pour out a scoop away and you're meant to have 30 and it's 32 just leave it like just don't worry about it like especially if you're in an off season or, or you're not looking for an extreme amount of leanness like it's more hassle than it's worth to take it back out again you know so just leave it there yeah. and that, that's just going to add to kind of this problematic relationship with food you can develop about being hyper specific especially in times when you just don't need to be it's not necessary well, I mean, that sort of specificity, God, that's a big word, uh, <laughs> can lead to, to burnout. If someone want, like, has this all or nothing mindset, they have to do everything and they, do, they, they weigh their broccoli their way to the gram, they might burn out and end up doing nothing because they're just like, this is too hard, this is taking too long, I don't have the time for this. So thinking about like, knowing what we know about um, the energy density of food, maybe we want to estimate our fruits and veggies. We're not going to weigh them. We know what 100 grams approximately looks like if we're an extra 20 30 grams over like okay go enjoy your three calories but if we're 20 grams over on butter or peanut butter or oil like that's a big deal so maybe we do want to weigh those things and like dean mentioned he's still weighing some things but like he's not worrying about lean protein and veg and potatoes and things like that and you especially don't need to do it when it's at least somewhat portion control you know like you, you, even if you buy a block of chocolate, the squares are somewhat portion control. Right. You okay. Know? You know that so lint like, one square. Yeah, I can have my one big square of lint and it's ten grams or twenty yeah. grams or whatever it may be. So, um, interestingly though, like we have we have had an individual uh, show that it is possible to take an informed approach to a contest prep in really? Menno Hanselman's. Oh yeah. Uh, he got peeled on not tracking a thing. Wow. But what you'll probably find is two things. One, he would have just taken the same approach we talked about in regards to the foundation diet. So like if you don't overconsume anything that's highly calorific, gram for gram, you're going to get lean because you're going to eat low enough. Um, the issue though is that you potentially are leaving a lot of performance as a performance athlete or as a bodybuilder or a figuring competitor or whatever it may be. You're potentially leaving some recoverability and performance even on the side there in preference for just saying, hey, I don't want to track macros because you'll likely under eat again in fear of overeating. Mm. And thus you're, you're potentially limiting your potential to actually give your best physique. But it, it is actually possible, but he's also probably one of the most educated, well-read people mm. going around that he understands that I can do this and get away with this. And there's this much margin of error. And I know that my hunger right now is more hedonic than it is homeostatic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But I think he did it all the way up to about four weeks out. Well, I um, and then he was just kind of like, I want that last little bit. So now let me track what I'm eating most of the time. And also he ate pretty much the same food every day. Uh, I think Eric Helms did the same. In, he calls his the default diet. He did his default diet uh, up until about 10 weeks out. And then he realized his results were just sort of stalling. Um, and he was kind of like, ah, I need to figure out where these are stalling from. Don't quote me on that for 10 weeks out, but he's pretty close. Um, and he did it to sort of from an educational also example perspective. So the take home from that comment is, is that the education is worth it. Yeah. Doing the education, understanding your personal needs, all of these things is worth it because it gives you the opportunity then to have more freedom around how specific you need to be in your trackability. Hmm. Yeah. And I find because, that was, sorry, go on. No, you. No, I was just going to say, because for me, um, as part of my profession, I, I travel quite a bit to lots of different sites all over the UK. And sometimes I just forget to bring my scale, but then I don't even notice that I forgot to bring it because I'm able either, as you said, have like packaged things that are easy to kind of just count on their own or I just kind of eyeball it and I never really like miss it. It's always like, oh, oh well. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah. yeah, I kind of have um, a similar story of uh, <laughs> when I stopped tracking macros. I don't know if you remember, Dean, but um, I can be kind of forgetful. And Dean and I were traveling to New Zealand. Except when I do things wrong. Exactly. <laughs> I remember that. Don't worry. Um, we were traveling to New Zealand and I left my phone at home. And like my phone is my MFP, right? So I didn't have my MyFitnessPal to track my food. And I remember having this little freak out at the airport. Do you remember this? Yeah. And I was like, not, not like a proper freak out. I wasn't hyperventilating, but I was just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to eat? Like, how will I know what to eat if I don't have my MyFitnessPal? Um, and I, I really had no choice because Dean was using his MFP on his phone. So I couldn't use that. So I had to sort of on the fly do the foundation diet and like learn for myself what that meant. This is well before we were teaching it to clients and well before we had written life after dieting, a guide to informed eating. Um, and you know what? I didn't gain a gram 
I just stuck to my normal behaviors and it actually really helped me get confident in my ability to do the right thing, even without like this diary dictating to me, like to the gram what to eat. Mm. So I don't travel with scales anymore. <laughs> I haven't, you haven't, you, <laughs> haven't you haven't tracked macros in ages now. Have I haven't like, tracked macros in, I'm going to say years, um, as in like a full day. I still weigh things like, I still might weigh peanut butter or, or like oats or I don't know, like oil or something like that. But I don't figure out what my calories are over the course of the day because oh. I more or less know because I stick to the same things. Uh, but we just spent, uh, what was it, two weeks in Lisbon, which is the capital of Portugal, and they have the most amazing Portuguese The tarts. food there is meant to be amazing in Lisbon. Yeah, it's, it was yum. Portuguese food is really interesting. It's very simple. Yeah. Um, but then there's also some really delicious It's stuff. just like grilled fish and potatoes. You're like, look, you did, the, yeah, you did the fish really well. They put like olives randomly in everything. <laughs> so Anyways, but I, I had my fair share of tarts. You probably had a Portuguese tart most days. Yeah. And I know calories. that, pass, yeah, yeah, exactly. Those bad boys are pretty calorie dense. They're, um, they're quite but it's, small though, so they're like portion controlled. Yeah, yeah, they're not that heavy. Or oh, the other one we really liked was uh, bacalao brass. Mm. I said, I've just said that as, as Australian as possible. Which is, basically, <laughs> which is basically like fried potato with cod. And then an egg, a lot of oil. And it seems like, yeah, you're like, oh, it's not too bad. But mm. this is the one where you're like, oh, there's probably more in it than what I think. And then we looked up a recipe for it. And there's a, there's a lot more calories in that bag. <laughs> so because much of how oil. much oil and eggs they um, use that you don't realize that are in it. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah. even though they are portion controlled, if I'm eating my regular food and then I'm adding this, I don't know, 250 calorie thing on top, 250 calories over my maintenance calories is enough for me to gain weight over a period of time. So what I did is like, I just left out, like for one meal, I would just have vegetables and protein and then I would leave out the carb and the fat in that meal. And I was like, we're square. Mm. It's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, no stress. But of course, if I had a really specific, and I could lose weight on informed eating as well, I would maybe just have no snacks except for fruit and one or two meals of protein and veg. Like that would be fine as well. Mm. But you have to give up a little bit of control if you want to do informed eating in the sense that it's not so specific it's close enough. And for me, that's good enough. Again, a goal specific. Yeah. Right tool for the right job to steal that terminology from Broderick Chavez. I think that's such a, such a fantastic single liner for people to realize, like, what is the right tool for the right job? Like, what are you trying to achieve? And yeah. If we can determine what you're trying to achieve, we can then determine what the best course of action is to take. Right. Yeah. And sometimes what you're trying to achieve is chilling the fuck out and then it's getting really lean and then it's putting the weight back on, then chilling the fuck out again. And so we want to be what we call method fluid. We go from, you know, the informed eating method back to macro tracking, back to whatever. Like, it's not like if you move to informed eating, like that's it forever. If I wanted to have a specific weight goal again and I felt more comfortable macro tracking, I'll just do that. I'll pick up my MFP and I'll track again. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, that you just pretty much, that's the life cycle of me for the last uh, 110 odd weeks, right? Mm. Um, an informed approach is an ineffective approach for me to take when I want to try and gain weight significantly because my natural predisposition is to sit lower on, on the appetite scale and to sit lower on body weight. So, you know, 120 odd weeks ago before I started coaching with Joe, I was eating with the informed approach and I was maintaining my weight at about 100 to 102 kilos. And I said- Which is what in pounds for those who- uh, 220, 225, something okay. like that, right? So I was like, all right, I need to forcibly now understand that I need to eat more food in order to progress the scale weight, in order to progress the training performance and therefore muscle. And I can't do that with an informed approach because I'd just be constantly worried about like under eating because I, I get full easy. Yeah. So it went from informed eating, off-season weight maintenance or weight neutral to off-season tracking diet specific drive weight up, Complaining into, about being full all the time. Yeah, like <laughs> eating eating in the absence of hunger, mm. you know, like actually forcibly eating and then back into a contest prep, uh, an accurate diet representation there too, either tracking macros and or following a diet because there was a specific goal to now post comp back into an informed eating approach where I'm, I'm just using sensibility and, and what I know to manage my calorie intake. Mm. And that's sort of the life cycle of how I, I use the informed to tracking to informed approach. 
Yeah, and I suppose if, Dean, you found that your weight wasn't going up at a rate that you would like it to after comp, you might go back to macro tracking because just going off your hunger signals, for example, um, or your daily normal behaviours isn't good enough yeah, to reach I would, that goal. I would track macros for one or two days, three or four days to see what I'm actually consuming, to see if I'm actually in the close proximity. Yeah. Um, so, like, for anyone that's interested in how I'm managing this now, I I pretty much, whenever... For I'm, those that don't know you, why don't you just say... <laughs> Oh, now is in like six weeks post competition. Yeah. So I just finished a bodybuilding season um, and I'm now six weeks post. From day one post comp, I went straight to informed eating. All right. Um, I know that I'm just going to pick arbitrary numbers that are easier for people to listen to. I know that I need a certain amount of calories and I know that I like to eat somewhere between four and five times per day on average. So if I say I have five meals and for the easy numbers, each meal I want to eat roughly 50 protein, 100 carb, 10 fat then that's my numbers per meal. And then on a meal by meal basis, I'm basically just somewhat taking stock of what I'm putting on my plate with the idea that I've got this goal of 50, 110. Because we are in another country and we're checking out new food, I do what Liz mentioned before with the, the pastel donata. Meal one for me actually typically is the 50 protein, but I, I try and remove the large majority of the 10 fat and the 100 carb. So I kind of bank that off to the side. And then I eat the next meal and it's usually roughly going to be 50, 110. And I'm like, cool. So meal two is complete. That's now out of my brain. Meal three is complete. That's out of my brain. Then we go out for dinner and I eat something. And I'm like, well, that was probably like 20 to 30 grams of fat. It was probably about the hundred carb. All right. Well, I've just caught, caught up from meal one. I'm on target today. And then I can have my meal before bed. That's roughly similar. Or if I've, you know, under or over, I can kind of give and take a little bit, but that's how I manage the food and the meal by meal basis, at least in my brain. So it's not like I'm completely devoid of just going the intuitive route and just going, fuck it, let me listen to this because I'm still hungry and I still have appetite drive uh, because I'm still relatively lean and I'm coming out of comp. It's just that I'm, yeah, have the ability to navigate whichever way I want to go. And if you were going full blown uh, intuitive eating, you probably would eat the house down because you are so hungry and you might not feel like egg whites and vegetables. Or I would at least do it for a period of time until I was over consuming to the point where I didn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the learning phases, I think, even in intuitive is, is um, uh, what's the terminology they use? Like the freedom to, to, to eat. Unconditional permission to eat. Yeah. And there are periods where some, like I've, I've had a friend that's done this with a food psychologist where he was given the unconditional permission to eat until he was done. Stuffed, yeah. And all they, all they were interested in is just eat until you finish. Yeah. And then. He was trying to get over binge Then write it down. He had a binge, a, a star binge cycle. That was such a mess. He was in a star binge, binge cycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it was like, he's like, I remember day one, he told me he said, the only reason why I stopped eating wheat bix in the morning was because I was going to be late for work. Oh and then day two, it was a little bit less. And then day three, it was a little bit less. And then day four, he was like, oh, I'm not even really that interested anymore. I've just realized that I've been doing this just because I think I, I can't have it. Or I'm not supposed to. Yeah, yeah I'm not supposed to. So um, mm. I would probably do that for the first period of time. And then, mm. yeah. Yeah, so do you find it hard to manage the informed eating approach when your hunger signaling would have been kind of abnormally high because of how lean you were? Or did the numbers help you kind of stay in check? As, as somebody who's done this now, like, so I can't my fire out, man. I don't even know when I started tracking macros 12 years ago or something like that. Um, I've done this once before. So my last comp in 2018, uh, we went to Japan four weeks afterwards. And I knew that Japan's the food capital of the world. And I went, if I get there in this state, this is going to be a problem. So I actually forcibly tracked and overconsumed food deliberately to get my weight back as close to like homeostasis as possible within four weeks. So that I, I was sort of like giving myself some ammunition when I got there that I didn't have to deal with. So I learned some behaviors there and I think it's just carried over. Um, do I find it difficult? I definitely have to be consciously aware of it. And I can, I can still be caught out in that period where as soon as I start to eat, I don't want to stop or I want to feel excessively full every now and then. Um, but I think it's a learned practice for sure. You know? Yeah. Somebody who doesn't have such a great relationship with food might not want to jump straight into informed eating. There is like a, a process that yeah. people can take, which we teach in the book. Um, because it might be easy to justify poor eating practices by saying, well, I'm not tracking, I'm doing informed eating. Like, no, bro, you're just eating your feelings. Like they're, they're very different. So I, I would encourage people to 
assess what their relationship with food is, assess their ability to manage hunger and like be honest with themselves before deciding if they're just going to like jump ship from macro tracking to informed eating. Like maybe you want to be somewhere in the middle. Maybe you want to stick with macro tracking with an increased daily calorie target until, you know, you've put on a little bit of body fat and it's easier for you to manage your behaviors without macro tracking. Like there's, there's some stepping stones that can be taken. It's just like Dean's relationship with his hunger, you know, his, his willpower with food is just, is quite good. Yeah. But even like my childhood and my setup around food, there was never negative discussion around food. Like I, I've probably been given the greatest opportunity to never struggle with my weight possible just based on my childhood. So yeah, I would never take somebody from post comp to this phase that I'm doing typically with any kind of confidence. I would be very nervous. Uh, and like Liz, there's always like a step like approach. Like there's a phase that people have to go through. Mm. Um, if they don't, it's, a, it's, it's possible that you could succeed in this moment, but it's also possible that all shit could hit the fan and it could go real sour real quick. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So then when you have like a client presenting to you, what kind of signs do you look out for that make you think, oh, this would be a good idea to kind of transition them into this approach for a while? Is there any kind of signs you'd look out for? That would be, I mean, are you asking Dean for his comp preppers or me for my gen poppers? Well, either really, because it'd be interesting to see both sides of it. Okay. The difference would be like Dean or a comp prep coach isn't necessarily trying to set up healthy, balanced, sustainable behaviors for healthy, balanced, sustainable results. Because comp prep is none of those things, right? They're like extreme behaviors for an extreme result. And then they rebound with their weight and that's what they're meant to do. But for me as a gen pop coach, it's not like that at all. I'm, I am setting up sustainable, balanced, healthy behaviors to achieve an outcome that can be achieved forever and ever and ever. Yeah, like ideally. So I would fill not like start with filling knowledge gaps, start by setting up behaviors that might be through macro tracking, that might be through the foundation diet, depends where they're at. Um, and if macro tracking is becoming, you know, a time stress on someone or, you know, they, their family finds it too much for them weighing it out or whatever, then we could figure out what the alternatives are. Mm. Some people try informed eating and they just don't like the idea of not being sure. So then we can have a combined approach. It's like, okay, well, let's track your protein to make sure you're at least hitting that as a minimum target. And then we'll foundation diet the rest. We'll make sure that your portion sizes, we're going off a hand guide again, are about right. Or maybe macro tracking is working so well for someone, but they can't stand the idea of doing it while they go on holidays. So we'll move to informed eating in the holidays or something like that. And then we, we might move back to it. Um, but Dean deals with a different kettle of fish. Mm. But I mean, the framework is one and the same. The difference is just probably the level of extremity that we dial it up and dial it down. Mm. And for me, I'll say to a lot of people, uh, the action of somebody is actually a lot less important to me than the intention and then the thought process around that action prior to, during and after. So like, um, you know, like even if we took that free meal, here's one that I reference a lot with my clients. The first, first meal post comp typically tells me a lot about the person and what their thoughts are, what their intentions are, and then what their actions are in regards to how they align. An individual who leaves the competition uh, stage and then immediately goes to the fastest, most easily readily available calorific food possible. Macca's or something. McDonald's, yeah. donuts from a service station, those kinds of things, milkshakes, really five easily guys. accessible foods. But yeah, I would, I would move. What was that one? Five, five guys, guys, yeah. Oh, I would five. move. So anything that requires some form of an order and sit down is a little bit better than just a quick grab. Okay. Tells me that the person now is seeking this satisfaction immediately and they haven't even thought about it. And I'm like, that, those people make me nervous versus even if they only had one donut or two, no, two donuts versus the individual who then sort of has a normal meal to sort of get them through post comp then they go out and have this social experience with friends and family they order some starters some mains some desserts but they make it about the social experience and the food is enjoyable too they may actually eat more from a calorie perspective than the other person but it's the thought process the intentions then the action that tells me like how does this person view food are they seeing it as an opportunity just to, to quickly get it in? Or are they seeing this now as 
finally, I can let the reins out a little bit on my, my inability to enjoy food with friends and family. I can now do that. And then my preference is as post comp is that we sort of just push food up really quickly, but we still keep it pretty accurate. And then as time progresses and, you know, the one, the fear of weight gain disappears if people have that, or two, uh, the fear of over consuming, like they just can't stop. As that starts to dissipate as weight comes up, then again, we start to give them more opportunity to free those reins up. And it might be like, you know, a free meal in its entirety with a calorie controlled day. It might be an informed meal throughout the week, or it might be you can have up to X amount of loosely tracked meals, which would be like five guys, you know, like, because like you mentioned before, let's say it's 20% out. We're going to say, hey, let's allocate a thousand calories to that meal. And it's going to be probably wrong, but it's close enough. Yeah. Um, and we're slowly but surely giving people some freedoms back and teaching them it's okay to undereat, overeat, eat whatever you want, choose this food, don't do that food. And then we kind of just try and mold it all together. So you're saying that the way that you assess if a client is ready for informed eating or not is like their attitude towards food. It's mainly attitude and language, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? That's really interesting because um, I've always thought that I've been, I, I love food, like I have a food page. I, I, my parents are in the food business. It's been like I've grown up in it all my life. But I would not just go and eat for eating sake. I would never go to McDonald's. I would never get fast food. As you said, like when my last show I did uh, was the UK DFBA finals 2019. I went out for a meal with like Jasmine and Joe and all my friends. And we all sat down and had a meal together. So I'm much, I would just never waste a meal on something that was just grab and go just to get it down for the sake of it. That's not something I would enjoy. Yeah, well, as you know, you know, we went for a table of food with everybody yeah, at Thai. Awesome. Um, it was good Thai. Yeah, like, uh, and, and like Thai was food that is is not a manageable, trackable food in prep. Mm. So that was a great opportunity. I love Thai food. Liz Thai, loves Thai food. And I, th- I, th- I had one main. I didn't think I had a starter. But it was enjoyable, so. you know. Uh, but before that, I ate, I remember I ate 300 grams of chicken breast in the car on the way. Because <laughs> I was like, you know, I may as well like not go to this feeling extremely hungry, at yeah. least from a, a homeostatic perspective, right? And then the same thing, we had dinner at a Turkish restaurant and there was some bread and there was some dips and there was some meat and there was some rice. There was all these things. Um, but it was about having the opportunity to now say thank you to all of the people around me that suffered <laughs> due to my, my personal decision to, to compete, you know. Um, and I've kind of just always like lived that life thereafter now. You know, Liz and I eat at home a lot. We still prep a lot of food. We still have the same foundational pro- sort of practices. It's just that we wouldn't go out. We enjoy some food too. Yeah, and there's more than one option. Like if Dean was to eat out um, and it was his off season because he wouldn't eat out on prep, he there might be one choice on a menu that he could choose from because it was trackable and it had enough protein. Mm. The beauty now is like we can go to a restaurant and be like, you know what? There's like four things we could choose from out of this like 20 item menu. This yeah. is awesome yeah the freedom of it is nice but even like going back to the Thai meal that we had like I noticed that Lizzie ordered extra vegetables because she obviously that was kind of an informed choice she was making to make herself feel fuller on what she was ordering yeah <laughs> it's so funny when you uh, order some the, some modification when people don't have English as a first language it's always interesting to see what you'll actually end up with yeah yes, no, <laughs> I'm, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm huge on vegetables not only like do I enjoy the taste of them but it's just a, I'm 60 kilos, like my, and I'm not that active. I train four times a week and have 12,000 steps on average a day. So my maintenance calories are like just shy of 2000, but I do have quite a big appetite. I like snacking. So I'll just choose the right foods and I'll make sure that I fill up on, on veggies, low energy density, high nutrient density, mm. high volume. But again, this comes down to your ability to eat the way that you prefer because you are a grazer. Mm. is still very, very informed so because she's a grazer it means that her main meals those three or four squared off meals are typically going to be more vegetable lean protein dominant than they are going to be carbohydrate and fat dominant because she picks those carbs and fats up from snacks yeah whereas you know another individual who is unaware of what that looks like on paper they snack and they also eat 600 normally. calorie meals yeah and, and snacks we know are far like small calorie additions done regularly throughout the day are far harder for you to consciously track in an informed manner and maintain and and, and control than it is to have three large meals mm-hmm. yeah and just you the know. snacks themselves are rarely going to be satiating either so if you don't have that education you're just not going to even think about it and it's not going to satisfy you so it won't contain yeah. your fullness in any way so yeah, yeah and you don't even have the reminder of the fullness you know whereas like 
we may go to an all-you-can-eat sushi and I may only eat three times that day instead of five times. And the fullness of that sushi meal is, is reminding me for like four hours, five hours, six hours. So then I get to dinner, I'm, like, I'm not even hungry. Like, mm. You know, so it, you're right. There's, there's no reference point for fullness on snacks because they're so small in volume. Yet the calories add up very quickly. Mm, yeah, they can. But again, she knows, so she can do this. Uh, but I'm also choosing like uh, low-fat cottage cheese and carrot yeah. sticks. <laughs> like I'm not choosing to snack on biscuits every time. It's like, yeah. Only yeah. when drinking tea. And the, oh gosh, tea and chocolate. Man. <laughs> tea and biscuit. Match made in heaven. Yeah. Have you ever like tried, you tried the biscuit tea when you're over here? There's a biscuit flavored tea. It's very nice. Uh, I didn't do England properly. It's so <laughs> <tried>, okay. <laughs> to flip this back on you as an Australian, Australian, then have you tried a Tim Tam slam? I've heard of Tim Tams. I don't think I've tried them. I would okay, like. Okay, so Tim Tam is a, like a rectangular biscuit. You oh, bite it's... off the opposing corners. It's like a penguin. But yeah. Okay. Way more delicious. Oh. Well, marginally better. Uh, if if they're if, better, I don't know about way. Yes. Okay. If, if <laughs> look, this is subjective. The, the Why are we chocolate, argue? The chocolate quality between on the outside coating of a of a Tim Tam versus a penguin, uh, light years. Okay. Apart. Tim Tams are definitely better. But anyways, you bite off the opposing corners of the Tim Tam, and yeah. you dunk one corner into coffee, tea, hot chocolate, whatever you've got, and you use the other side like a straw, and you mm -hmm. suck the hot drink up through the Tim wow. Tam. <laughs> it's like you don't want to do it in front of anyone. <laughs> you're trying to court because it's messy. The Tim Tam will like melt all over you and you'll get it all over your face, but it's so delicious. And obviously the, the heat of the fluid pulls the inside cream oh, of yeah. the Tim Tam through. Oh, like it melts the biscuit and yeah, it's good. I'll have to arrange them to be sent. I'll definitely get them shipped. Over. Try it with a, with a penguin. Oh, I will. I haven't had a penguin in ages. Cause I have that, I have like a little box of like hundred calorie snack bars and chocolate bars and stuff like that. Cause I like having things in my cup of tea as well. But I always yeah. like I'm I always buy things that are like packaged individually because I just hate when a big pack of biscuits goes stale because I just don't eat them quick enough. So yeah, these are all my little. This is a great a great representation of informed choices. Oh, thank you. <laughs> because, like, this is very similar too. She will choose she will choose some snacks to say like, hey, I would like I like a snack that's in a packet that I can have that's sub this amount of calories, give or take, you know. Or I would say the other day, what was I purchasing for you? Protein, protein bars. What, I was like, yeah. what's your protein target and what's your maximum fat or calorie? And she just went, if it's sub 200 calories and roughly 20 protein, I'm good. Yeah. You know? It's just easy to make choices when you know what your guidelines are. Yeah. And I think people often perceive um, hmm, like boundaries or having certain restrictions yeah. as being like, I have to be restricted. I think having boundaries actually allows you to have freedom yeah. of choice because you know, like, what you can choose within those boundaries and still reach your goals. It's sort of like the best of both worlds. It's like knowing I'm going out, what do I want to spend tonight or, you know, at the shops or whatever. Okay. And I've got $200 to spend before I can't pay my bills. Awesome. Now I'm going to look at items below $200. But if you just have absolutely no idea, you're either going to buy nothing and be nervous about all of your decisions or just absolutely blow the budget and fuck your goals. Mm. But I think having these boundaries just, it, it, it does create freedom, freedom of movement. And that's the difference the of looking at it like restraint versus restriction too. Yeah. Like you have to show some level of restraint in regards to the calories that you consume. And yes, you will be restricted to some degree as to what you can do to stick within that. But like Liz said, it does provide you the freedom then to also like have your, have your cake and eat it too, quite literally. You know, <laughs> like true. you can dip your toe in the water and, and, and you're okay. Like, Do you think that's where fine. the saying comes from? I, I highly doubt it. <laughs> no, it's like some, uh, some British, I think it's some queen or something like that, that I have to, I remember the story, but uh, yeah, no, I don't know where it comes from. But what my, my phrase I like, that I think is important here is knowledge is power, because I think mm. having that awareness will give you that power and that freedom to kind of live life in a more enjoyable way. Can yeah. I extend on that quote? Yeah. yeah. Knowledge put into action is power because yeah. often people know they shouldn't be eating the cheeseburger, but they just don't do it because they, I don't know, their, their behaviours are set up poorly or their I'm mindset or motivation. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. So, so all, the, it's all the education that you have, mm -hmm. um, 
is is one thing it's good to know it but you also have to implement it as well like I could very easily switch off all the knowledge I have on nutrition and just eat whatever I want anyway and I could quite easily do that but I still have to make that effort to implement what I know because it's not always going to be a subconscious thing I do I do kind of have to actively think about it because otherwise because I have a big appetite I can eat a lot of food at once a day if I let myself yeah yeah, for sure. Uh, with putting what you know into action, I think it's helpful to allow yourself some leeway not to be perfect, especially when you're learning a new skill, habit or behaviour. You know, you, you can teach an old dog new tricks, yeah. but they're not going to do it perfectly right off the bat. So just because you might eat 50, 100, whatever, 500 calories over one day, it's not like, well, I'm a failure, I can't do this. It's like, what can I learn from this? Maybe I made, I could have made better choices of how I chose to fill those calories. So it was easier to stay on track. Okay, I'll try that tomorrow. You know, maybe tomorrow you'll fail again. Okay, what lesson can I learn from this? And eventually it's not going to be like failure, 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 success, success, success. You'll just fail less often. And isn't that success in itself? It's like a smoker wanting to quit and going cold turkey overnight. Maybe they'll have a, a lapse, which is different to a relapse. They might have one cigarette here or there, and eventually none at all. But in that transition process where they're trying to establish those new behaviours, little lapses are to be expected, and beating ourselves up about it is counterproductive. It can just corrode our confidence in our own ability instead of taking those lapses as lessons. Yeah, yeah I kind of say it to my clients well because I, I have some clients that kind of have to deal with managing overeating and, and binge eating sometimes um and they think if they have one binge that they failed and they have to go all the way back to the beginning but I I always explain that you know it's not just zero or 100 there's a whole spectrum in between so if you had one binge this week versus three that's still progress compared to last week even though you might yeah. have failure in that instant it's still on paper and statistically an improvement so you're you're working your way towards mm. success yeah. Absolutely. But there's there's two important things there. One is that you're having the conversation about like what is success to them as an individual, mm. because success is different to everybody else, you know. Mm. Um, and then two is that not being rigid in your approach, being fluid, like Liz said, you know, because that gives us the the opportunity as a coach to say, hey, like this is how we're going to measure success this week, and these are the things that we can use from a tool perspective to try and help here. Like maybe there's a benefit to them as one individual really learning about behavior modification and habit change and all of the things that potentially are problematic for them. But then maybe we have somebody else who's very black and white in their thought process and just needs to kind of understand the why mathematically. Because even if you had a binge once, the calories that are averaged out over time are so insignificant to what they would do to your body weight that it doesn't really matter. And they can start to let go of that all or nothing mindset like Liz has mentioned too, where one binge may as well have two, you know, yeah. or, you know, but no, yeah. so there's. Yesterday we had a team meeting around how to help clients move out of the all or nothing mindset actually. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, very important. important. Cause it's like the, how, um, how much psychology and mindset has an impact on your eating and your habits, because just like the same thing can happen, but you can have two different mindsets. You can have, oh God, I messed up. I might as well just give up altogether. You can say, okay, this is a blip. How am I going to, you know, draw a line and just get up tomorrow and just, just keep going and just see mm. a little blip and, and a stumble, which everyone has because life isn't perfect and there's never going to be a clear runaway for anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, weight management on paper is very easy. <laughs> Eat less, move more. Yeah, you know we've solved obesity. <laughs> Let's say even uh, I, I mentioned a guy, Broderick Chavez, before. He's a crass American. He's a funny guy, um, but he did a uh, let's. I don't want to call it a book, but he did a, a an ebook of some. It was called Post It Nutrition, like that, Post It like Notes. Post It Notes. Yeah, and that's it. It's like calories per kilogram. This is what you eat for maintenance. This is what you eat for. Like, this is how much protein. Nutrition done. Well, the whole like you know? purpose of the book was to say nutrition is this simple that you could write it on a post-it note. Yeah. Post-it nutrition. Um, mm. And that is absolutely true theoretically on paper. <laughs> but it's the fact that we have all of these other things to consider, environmental and social and family. Emotional. And, and a lot of people don't even know what they've been subjected to in the past too. Like I now know because I've learned through other people and reading that I got fucking lucky with how my childhood was set up. Mm. It was set up around a large amount of activity that was like enjoyable and performance driven. It was never about the food. It was always you should eat to enjoyment. I had lots of different foods. My parents never put pressure on me. 
But I didn't really know any of that until I realized there's a lot of other people like, yeah, no, no, I was told to force feed this food down until I finished it because yeah. my, my family was poor and yeah. the food that we chose to eat were chips and pies because it was cheap. And now I don't like vegetables because I, I didn't like grow up on them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like there's all of these psychological things that people need to be aware of. But again, this is just coming back to the whole concept of being able to make informed choices. We, we, we need the opportunity to be able to teach people what they don't know or aren't aware of. Fill the knowledge gaps. So we can fill those knowledge gaps yeah. and then they can start to move forward. Yeah, I think it's important for those listening who don't even plan to come out of tracking anytime soon that you do eventually, you will eventually need an exit strategy because you likely won't be wanting to do it forever. And you do, if you do come away from like physique goals or bodybuilding or whatever you're doing, like you, you need a way out and a transition away from that. So it's definitely something to think about and to educate yourself on and learn more about. Yeah. 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 I think if you feel stuck in a current uh, methodology. Yeah. Or fear that then you can't you, let go. That's the first, you need to recognize that real quick. And this is the same for training. It's the same for a contest prep framework. It's the same for food. If you feel like you are dogmatic in the necessity to retain the current approach that you're doing, and you think it is the best way. Or the only way. Or the only way you need to, I would, I would be checking that real fast and speaking to somebody that you trust. Uh, because you can definitely you definitely need to understand that there's far more fluidity in all of these approaches. Yeah. But also to be fair, like I have physique goals in the sense that I want to maintain my, I, I'm not in a weight neutral approach. Like if I gain body fat, I, I wouldn't be happy with that. If I lost muscle, I wouldn't be happy with that. I'm trying to maintain what I've spent, I don't know, like 12 years building. And I'm doing that with informed eating. Like, it's not like once you let go of physique goals, then you should move into informed eating. It's like, if you're at a stage where you think you can manage your goals, whether that's gain, loss, maintain, and you feel like it's overwhelming to be tracking forever, or maybe even just unnecessary, then there are other ways. It's not like it's macro tracking physique goals or not macro tracking, you're going to fall to shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> there's so much gray area between this black and white. Mm. Yeah, I'm actually, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in that kind of approach. Like, neck, I'm obviously, I've started prep now. But once I transition into my next off season, it'd be interesting. Because sometimes I just find, like, tr tracking was a bit, because I was eating enough food, like a bit of a chore and a bit unnecessary. And I was kind of just going through the motions of it, where it'd be nice to kind of give myself that, a little bit of autonomy and implement what I've tried and been learning all this time and, like, challenge myself to do it. Because I think a lot of it is, like, a little bit yeah. of fear as well, being like, oh, I don't trust myself. Of course, because if I mean, confidence comes from success and if you haven't had success not tracking before, I can understand like the lack of confidence or the fear in letting go. Um, but I, I suppose the, the important point to make here is you've got to allow yourself the opportunity to succeed. Mm. Um, so if you or any of your listeners want some guidance, you can book in uh, for consultation calls from the website or grab our book if you're an um, independent learner and you want to learn from the book. Or we do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Mm. But I suppose like for, for you or someone that just wants a little bit of guidance, consultations or the book is likely enough. Mm. Just go on a holiday and force it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that a holiday is actually, I know you're joking. I'm Dan, joking, yes. But I don't think a holiday for anyone who thinks that might be a good idea is a good place to start informed eating because what we want to be doing is maintaining uh, balanced, healthy behaviours and, and habits and when you're on a holiday, your routine is out the window. There's all this different food around. Temptations are increased. The environment and is maybe totally different. Totally different. And your feelings of restriction, because you might have just come out of a restricted phase, might impact your ability to make sensible choices. So we actually want to get ourselves into a place where we feel totally confident and comfortable in our behaviours before we go away on holidays yeah, and no, try and eating. Yeah, I know. Because even something as simple as you think like, oh, I normally eat lean protein for breakfast. And then you, you wake up in a country that doesn't really offer you that many opportunities or options, I should say, to, to do that. And then you're like, well, fuck it. I'll just have a pastiche. cake. I'll have cakes, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely, definitely wouldn't recommend it. No. Mm. No, no. Yeah. Well, so if people want to learn more about it, you mentioned briefly your website, but you want to actually tell them like your Instagrams, what the website is, what you offer for coaching. That'd be very helpful. Sure. So flexsuccess.com.au, it's still .au, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Uh, is our website and you can find, uh, we have more than just Life After Dieting, A Guide to Informed Eating. We've got our books and podcasts and courses and programs and uh -huh. all that stuff from there. And all of it is 
readily available and easily accessible via our Instagram, which is just flex underscore success. And then there's a quick link there in our bio and that links you into absolutely everything as well. So. Yeah. When is this podcast being released? Um, I'll probably upload it either today or tomorrow, I would say, because I'm due one this week. <laughs> I usually try and I try to keep up to a one a week schedule, but sometimes with guests, I've, all my guests are always at different time zones. So it makes it tricky sometimes. <laughs> OK, OK. In the next like week or so, we're releasing a, um, a free guide to food swaps. So people who don't have a lot of knowledge of nutrition uh, aren't, don't feel like they're ready to track yet but want to reduce their calorie intake, we have this little guide like, hey, swap this for this and this for this without reducing food volume, without impacting hunger. Um, yeah, so that might be helpful for people. You can leave your email address if you want to just stay up to date with, with what's going on via the link in bio as well. Mm-hmm. Even though it's going on, I'm so impressed with the amount that's, that's offered at Flex Success. It's uh, really, really cool to see. Thank you. Yeah. we've been going at it for some time now so i would hope it's more than just coaching yeah. <laughs> i've kind of been looking at you guys as inspiration because obviously my business is relatively new like i only really started coaching in the last couple of years um so it's nice to aim for that obviously i'm kind of building up slowly and i still have a full-time job so obviously <laughs> slows things down but um oh that's a lot but yeah but i'd like to eventually have a hub like that that has education and coaching and mentoring and stuff like that and be like all encompassing you know mm. how flattering thank you Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for joining on the podcast today. If you guys who are listening enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate if you could take a screenshot, put it on your story, tag myself and Dean and Lizzie. We would really, really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening again. And we will talk to you next time.